Waterbury Select Board. And the first item of business is to approve the agenda for the evening. So, um, now that said, um, I would like to ask you a question there at some point about uh, your uh, information there that you sent on the uh, uh, the police. Okay. Quick question there at the end, perhaps at the end of the meeting or some point. Okay, we can uh, we can put that under the manager's items if that works all right. Yep, do that. Okay. Having said that, I'll uh, approve the agenda as it appears with that addition. Make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay. okay. I'll second that. And that second. Uh, motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Next item is the consent agenda items, which uh, would be the minutes of the November 5th meeting and a uh, first class liquor license and outside consumption permit for Pegasus LLC. Is there a motion on the consent agenda items? I'd make a motion to approve that consent agenda items. Okay, Nat made the motion. Uh, your second, Chris? Absolutely. All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. Um, Carla, you've got the uh, the documentation for the license. Yes. Thank you. Right. Next item is uh, public. Um, any member of the public uh, care to speak tonight? There being no takers, we'll move on to the preliminary discussion of the Warwick Grant Trails and Facilities. We have Steve Blocksby and Nick Maynard here to uh, brief the board on this item. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm gonna talk generally about the program and we also have uh, Dana Allen and Amanda McKay from uh, Waterbury Area Trails Alliance here, and um, we've been discussing this uh, possible grant for um, a couple weeks. And um, let me just give a little bit of background for the benefit of the select board and uh, people who are uh, watching or in attendance. Uh, the governor formed the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Collaborative. Um, I can't give you an exact timeline, but um, I believe it was in conjunction with the last uh, legislative session. Um, it's been in existence for a year or so. And um, it's a representative group that includes the commissioner of um, Forest Parks and Recreation, Mike Snyder, and um, it um, includes um, another uh, state uh, cabinet member, and then it includes members of the nonprofit recreation sector, such as uh, Mike DeBonis, who is executive director of the Green Mountain Club, and, and then uh, it also includes people from the private sector who um, either market recreation products or have recreation businesses and so on, uh, Kingdom Trails in. Um, um, up in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, the Burke area is represented and so on. So um, they decided to do a pilot grant program this year and um, this group is commonly referred to as the VOREC um, collaborative or a group. And um, so the grant program is referred to as the VOREC grant. Um, our understanding is that in the initial uh, round is uh, going to be a hundred thousand dollars worth of grant funds and they're looking to grant this in either um, one or possibly two grants to communities it's um, intended to be a demonstration grant uh, with an economic development angle or um, uh, aspect uh, promoting economic development through recreation that's really the mission of this group so we've been working with Alyssa and um, the grant is uh, due in mid-December. So um, we, it's December 14th. So we wanted to bring this to you just in a preliminary way 
and uh, find out if you would uh, support it, and then bring back a uh, final proposal with a detailed budget at your December 3rd meeting. So um, Nick and I have been meet, uh, working with uh, Bill Shepock and Bill Woodruff to develop a scope for this grant. And this is unusual in that they have a checkoff, and the more categories that you can cover, the more competitive you are. So it's, um, you know, any grant program has its, um, you know, uh, game to play, if you will, or objective, I think is probably a better, a more political way to put it. So we've got a number of projects and um, that would, uh, that were, uh, suggesting some of these are current projects that we've been working on for a little while and some of them are somewhat new projects in recreation areas. So what I think I'd like to do is have Nick go over his projects and then I'll go over the trails oriented projects and then see if um, you know the um, folks from Wada here have anything to add at that point. Steve, All right. Could you move a little a flat mic over a little bit? Fine. Thank you. Um, all right, so some of the projects that um, like the Recreation Department has been working on or, or would like to see done, um, the lights out here um, and at Anderson Field have to get replaced at some point. Um, a lot of the fixtures are out, they're outdated, they've been around for many years, um, so like the new updated technology would save money on electricity and whatnot, and this grant could cover that, um, we think. Um, the, I mean, as Nat knows, the pool building um, is going through sort of a renovation um, like preliminary. preliminary phase uh, to accommodate uh, the handicapped and people who don't identify, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's been many years since that has been updated too. Um, so in order for um, like electrical work to be done, it has to be up to code. Um, and, and so, this grant could cover that as well. Uh, and then the signs, um, the previous rec director, Deb Fowler, had already quoted um, signs to get replaced. Um, she had gone through a permit process to get two signs put up at Hope Davy, um, which I've been told still it's still good. Uh, I just um, looped that cost into this grant too. Um, it's kind of minuscule uh, in comparison to the other projects, but it's something in this grant. Uh, it checks off one of the check boxes that Steve was talking about, making it competitive. Um, so as far as recreation is concerned, that's uh, the, the recreation department. That's uh, the projects that we have uh, included in. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to um, be reminded what both Nick and Steve said is that <clears throat> a lot of the things that have been identified that are eligible for this grant are things that will be doing anyway. There are things that are in our budget to be done, capital budgets to be done in the, in the next few years. So the lights, for example, um, we need to change out those lights. We need to get more efficient fixtures. If we can simply identify that as a need, um, show uh, the fact that uh, we're going to hopefully get a grant from Efficiency Vermont to pay for half of the cost of the lights themselves. Um, if we end up getting this grant, it will save us money from something that we were already <coughs> intending to do. And it's a bit unusual because most grants are not for um, enhancing or improving something that you already have. They're to give you something different. But I asked Steve a couple of different times, and he said, no, they're looking to, to give this type of grant in order to uh, facilitate this type of work getting done. So the things that Nick just said, uh, it would be a definite money saving, cost savings to the town if this grant is uh, funded, because we'd be doing these things anyway over the next two to five years. Is there uh, a match requirement with this grant? Uh, there's no stated match requirement. Um, when we talk about the budget in just a few minutes, uh, preliminary you know, budget that we were looking at, uh, we would recommend a, a match. Um, so that would probably be in the neighborhood of um, 
you know, 30 or 40 percent. But um, as our, our understanding is that there's no match requirement for this program. It's quite flexible. You probably will make it a little more competitive if we have a match. Yeah, de definitely. That's always the case. So uh, we're recommending a cash match that could come out of the, uh, the CIP. Budget funds. Has this grant been given out before? This is a brand new <coughs> pilot program. There, there are obviously. Okay, so you can't look at a previous year and have No, okay. no. This is a new group that's formed. Uh, they're, they've consolidated their mission, and, and this is a new program. And I think the idea is that it's a pilot, and they would um, expect these communities to go on, and, and uh, I'll talk. Uh, now about the trails projects, and you know some of the, some of the work of the of this grant would set the stage for more implementation. So they really want to see a, a program that would move forward and uh, have an ongoing economic benefit. So the trails portion of the project, um, we're anticipating three different elements, and um, two of them would be uh, on the ground implementation. One would be uh, more on the planning side. And um, the first is the community path that uh, goes, bless you, that runs from Lincoln Street up to the golf course and uh, Guffle Road. And this path uh, gets a lot of use at certain times. It's uh, used by the gravel grinder race uh, in the spring and then by Lee Peepers Marathon. Uh, <coughs> many sections are grass and uh, somewhat poorly drained just because um, there's been a little work done over the years as far as any grading or additional uh, gravel and crushed stone. So what we're recommending is to uh, basically resurface that path and um, we would use a, um, a crushed gravel base of about six inches and then about six inches of uh, stay mat and um, probably a, a 10 foot width, something of that nature. <laughs> so that it really would be serviceable, especially for these events. These are um, uh, really terrific economic development drivers in the community, and I think we can make a good argument that this path um, will, will have benefits and then day-to-day uh, -day benefits so where we can really boost uh, the use of, of that path and the connection, off-road connection paralleling Route 100. Then um, the second project would be another signage project, uh, I think, you know we're going to be doing wayfinding signage in conjunction with the Main Street reconstruction. It looks like that project's going to be able to move forward. Uh, Bill can maybe fill in on that later. And um, so what we'd like to do is have complementary wayfinding signage that would be in our park system. And um, it would basically be oriented towards um, wayfinding, uh, especially for trails, the Cross Vermont Trail, the community path, and also um, for the recreation facilities for people who are coming in from out of town. So um, we haven't designed the system yet. We would program some money for graphics, but the idea is that there would be complementary mapping, complementary to the wayfinding kiosks that are part of the Main Street reconstruction project. And then we would probably have some trailhead, um, enhanced trailhead signs for both the Cross Vermont Trail and the community path with maps. Uh, those, those paths have uh, trailhead maps, but they're pretty minimal, so we really want to expand that so people can orient themselves. And then the third project is um, a follow-up to the uh, Waterbury Village to Little River State Park Connector Trail project that we did, um, finished up in 2016. Um, and we really need to take the next step to work with landowners more closely and develop either easements or um, agreements. And this is a project that we would work really closely with WADA along with the other two on the ground projects to try to get that project shovel ready so that we could apply for um, implementation funds. We're really not there yet. We've had um, some really good preliminary conversations with um, really all the landowners that are involved in the route we've mapped out, but we need to take that the next step. So that would be one where we set the stage for uh, future uh, recreation grant funding for implementation. So as far as the budget, I mentioned that uh, the uh, pilot has $100,000 available. Um, we've done some preliminary budgeting, and it looks like uh, the total project at this point in time would be about $70,000. 
and um, we would uh, apply for $50,000 in grant funding, uh, I guess in hopes that another community, and I, th I think there's going to be a lot of interest in this program, would also be interested in a $50,000 grant, and they would do two pilots. I think that, um, you know, is a scenario that we could um, maybe encourage in our own way. But we don't want to get overboard on what on overambitious and what we want to accomplish. And this would give us good, solid funding for the pool building, which is going to be a uh, you know pretty substantial project for the um, uh, family and gender gender neutral bathrooms and changing facilities and so on. And it would give us good, solid funding for the lighting project, including electrical installation, and then uh, more modest funding for these other projects. So again, this is preliminary. Uh, we wanted to get some feedback, uh, some guidance, and then we would work with Bill and with Melissa and the folks from WADA to develop an application to bring back to you on December 3rd. So Mark, I've got a couple questions there. Like when uh, when you hear a good time for it. I'm not hearing. Um, well, I said I had a couple of questions there. Got to do with it's a good time. Yep, go right ahead, Chris. Okay, um, Steve or Nick here, the uh, eligibility for the lighting, is that, uh, is this grant somehow tied in with the, uh, what is it, Act 54 there, the uh, uh, efforts to uh, have 90% renewables by 2050, is that why, is that what makes that eligible? The fact that we are upgrading them to a more energy efficient uh, bulb? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure what it's exactly tied to. Um, I, the person that I've been in contact with at Efficiency Vermont says that um, there's a, we get the max rebate per outdoor light fixture, which I think is $200 per light, light fixture. Um, and What's the efficiency percent? Uh, it's 60 to 75% of, of what is used currently. Um, so it, it probably is tied to. I just don't know the. So Chris, Chris, it's not a it's not a direct tie into that um, efficiency or the you know the legislation as far as uh, you know reducing your electrical input. It just happens that this is something that uh, <clears throat> this grant will fund as an enhancement to recreation, and it if we get the money, it's just helpful in that. It will help us do something that we were planning to do anyway. The Efficiency Vermont grant, um, I believe, is independent of this. Even if we were not funded with this and went ahead with the lighting on our own, we would still be eligible for that Efficiency Vermont money. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, second question was, Steve, did you say the, the budget amount for these projects altogether was, what, 70000 it's about, this is a current, a preliminary budget, <clears throat> mind you. We're still waiting for estimates on like the electrical installation work for the, um, for the lighting and the work in the, uh, the pool building. So this is uh, preliminary based on various conversations that we've had with contractors and suppliers. So it would be about uh, $70,000 and then we would um, aim for a $50,000 grant uh, leaving a local match of about twenty thousand dollars, but okay, that, that could vary okay. based on. Is that? I guess my question is that uh, going to be asked as additional money as part of the budget for this coming year, or is that something that you've already is is already in the budget? Well, you know what I mean. Is, yeah. Is it, it, it going to be in addition to the normal budget? <laughs> money. I'm just trying to get a feel for. Um, I don't whether it's an increase in the in the current budget, uh, or or whether it's kind of in there already. Yeah, I think Bill's got an answer for us, Chris. Yeah, it it's mainly in there already. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily have a plan to do anything on this trail uh, before this grant opportunity, but this is a, a decent opportunity. But as I said, the the work that's that we contemplate to do for the lighting, the work that we're planning to do at the, at the pool building uh, in and of themselves, and the signage is something that we were already going to be doing in the next year or two. So I look at this as a savings, Chris. There'll be a match, but it's not gonna be as much as 
if we had to do it all ourselves, which is what we were thinking we were going to have to do. No, I'm not. I'm not uh, objecting to it at all. I'm just trying to get it, get a figure in my head as to, you know, I've already got a kind of a figure in my head as to what we're looking at for, you know, the discussion we had here back a little while ago on truck replacements and paving of uh, of uh, Loomis Hill, uh, and we also got uh, uh, the police department addition coming. I'm just trying to get the numbers in my head as to what we may be looking at for kind of a whole increase for this next year. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm working on that too. It, it, I'm making some progress a little later in this evening's meeting. We're going to talk about some of those numbers. But, um, you know, there's certainly a work in progress, and it's going to be January before we know them all. So just so that I can frame this the way I, I think I'm hearing it, it looks like uh, the projects that Nick spoke to and the uh, community path and signage pieces are uh, something that you would be looking at to do solidly. The village to uh, the state park access trail is uh, at a planning level point for this grant for further implementation later on. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, this grant program is primarily oriented to orientation or to implementation, excuse me, but um, they do want to encourage uh, planning for future projects as well. So I think that element is uh, beneficial. Good. Good. All right. So, um, what are you looking for from us at this point? You want to take exploratory steps, but yeah. what, what do you actually need? Right. I, I don't think we necessarily need a motion. I think we, we just need a sense of the select board. If you think this is a good idea, if you want us to bring it back to you on the third with a more detailed budget and a proposal for a grant application. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm very supportive. I'm, I'm excited about the community task and some resources. And signage, the way signage makes a lot of sense. And I think if it gives us the opportunity to uh, uh, to leverage some grant funding for expenses that we're facing anyway, that makes yep. good sense. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it would be foolish not to explore it. Okay. Good. Great. Thank okay. you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that Chris's uh, comments about um, the uh, energy efficiency of the lights, I think you could roll that in, that you would be complying with that legislation and another reason to do it. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Waterbury Ambulance Service. Gentlemen. Come on up to the table here. You can introduce yourselves, because I'll get your names wrong. <laughs> we left the mic on for you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, is this the one that uh, we you had given me a couple of uh, weeks ago? It is not. It's been updated just a little bit. Okay. So I sent this out to you folks over the weekend. I don't know if you had a chance to yeah. look at it, but it's pretty similar <coughs> to, to what, what I shared electronically. So, uh, I'm James Turbanowski, uh, trustee chair for Warfare Ambulance Service. Mark Padre is executive director. Well, welcome. So, um, um, if you remember a year ago, uh, these folks came in and had a preliminary discussion. Um, I've met with, with these two fellows a couple of different times and with Mark, along with representatives from Duxbury and Moortown, the other two communities that are directly served by WASI, and um, they're here tonight to uh, have a discussion with the board about where they are with the, their finances and, and how they operate to uh, educate us and to share uh, their concerns about the future and funding of this uh, essential organization. So with that, have at it. All right. Well, we prepared a packet for you with some general information. Um, the first couple pages are not too much you haven't seen before. We did include, however, uh, a trans 
report summary as well as the uh, illustration of the transports by towns from 2016 until the year to date. And as you can see, Waterbury uh, <coughs> is our largest uh, user. In uh, 2018, for example, you, we responded to 579 calls in Waterbury alone. As with most ambulance service, most ambulance services of our in our design are facing budget shortfalls. The uh, reimbursements are just not matching the expenses, the cost to operate the service. It, for example, the water ambulance, it costs us $999.11 per day to operate. And that includes a phenomenon that we call cost of readiness. We have to be ready 24-7, 365 days, equipment, the whole bit ready to roll. I'll give you an example as, as far as the shortfall goes on the reimbursements. So Waterbury Ambulance charges $750 for what we call an ALS-1 call, Advanced Life Support call. The Medicare reimbursement rate for that level call is I'm sorry, $437. 20% of that is paid for that patient. So just about 50% of where we charge. That same call for a Medicaid recipient, the reimbursement rate is three, uh, $349 for that particular call, and we cannot back bill the patient for that, so we have to accept $349 for that call. Another issue that we are facing is with insur commercial insurance is paying the patient directly. And while most patients will turn around and pay us, we have a substantial number of those that don't. And back in three years ago, the Vermont Ambulance Association, of which I, I am a member of the legislative committee, were successful in getting legislation passed which basically says the insurance companies need to pay the providers directly. However, they included words in there based on the terms and conditions of the health insurance policy. So the loophole that many insurance, private insurances were using is just that, to put it in your policy that the patient will receive the check and therefore will pay. <coughs> we are planning to meet with the Department of Banking and Insurance in the near future discussed eliminating that loophole. It was not in the spirit of the legislation in the first place to allow that. <clears throat> Wasi's gone from 100% volunteer to now one where we have two full-time paid staff plus four per diems to cover the open shifts. The calls are going up. The acuity level is going up. Our protocols and our scope of practice is going up to include more stuff that we can do hence higher charges that we incur. So what we are looking at, we're looking at a, a uh, per capita rate of $18.83. And compare that to other areas, per capita from around the state vary from anywhere from $63 in Randolph down to $4.22 in Rockford. We have also, in doing the calculations, included Waterbury's in-kind contributions, the Capital West payment, the building, et cetera. And we also discussed, um, in light of this incorporation request, that our bylaws would be adjusted to reflect the appointment of one representative from each town that you serve, and that would be appointed by, by the select boards of the towns. We already have representatives from each of the towns that we serve, but they're voted in by the members. And the members are people who traditionally volunteered for WASI. Correct. They are the membership of that is correct. WASI. We've also included in the back of the packet our 2018-19 budget, illustration of our capital improvement plan, as well as the balance sheet. So you see our budget in the next two last pages, and then our balance sheet, which is primarily uh, capital reserve. <coughs> 
And in the last few years, although it is capital reserve, we've had to use uh, some of those funds to uh, pay for operating expenses. Okay. Um, no, it's clear from looking at the numbers. I mean, the, uh, the bulk of the services that you provide are to the Waterbury community, and uh, it's, it's uh, pretty clear uh, from everything. And also in looking at the types of calls and, and what results in transports and everything, it's, it's obvious that uh, the bulk of your work is with serious uh, life care. So um, no questions with that. Um, we have Chris Yens on the other end of the line here. Uh, Chris, did you, you have any observations you wanted to share with the group right now? Yeah, actually I do. Um, on the, um, the per capita sheet, um, must be, it's been updated a little bit from 18, I got 18, $18.78, but you're saying it's 1883. Uh, but uh, the in-kind, I guess, is the in-kind credit. Um, <coughs> is that something that you carry? It's got to be an expense to you every year, obviously, or expense to somebody. Um, wouldn't that just be part of your budget rather than you're, you're basically saying that your shortfall is $70,000 uh, and you, you've turned around, I mean, Waterbury's per capita is almost 100,096,454. Then you give us an in-kind credit, uh, and that drops us down to 40,000, basically. Um, are you still having to try to dig up that 56,000? Are you considering it as a loss, kind of, but you still got to be able to put the bill on it, or? Is that just a normal part of your budget? So, so they don't they don't pay those expenses. Um, the um, the dispatching is is easy to explain uh, in that um, when the red phone system went away a number of years ago, um, the fire department was uh, switched to Capital West for dispatching, and we rolled. Uh, the WASI dispatching into that. So when Capital West did a um, an analysis of their rate structure and then determined how much they were going to bill each town, it was a combination of grand list, the number of fire calls, and the number of ambulance calls. And back in the in the day, and I can't remember right off the top of my head what year we first moved away from that. Um, Waterbury's bill from Capital West, and I'm just picking numbers out of the air now, was $65,000. And we had a number that said the ambulance calls are worth whatever, and it, which is, again, picking another number, was $30,000. In those days, Waterbury paid that expense to Capital West, and then we sent a bill to WASI because they didn't want to burden the taxpayers at all. So they paid their dispatching. Sometime right after the flood, Brian Lindner and John Kiefner came to meet with the select board and said just what Mark and uh, we're being told now, um, that our expenses are going up. It's harder for us to pay these expenses. So they asked, could the town pay the full dispatching bill? So we pay their dispatching bill, which means we're paying the bill for dispatching not only in Waterbury, but in Moortown and in Duxbury as well. It's, it's the whole bill. So the, the um, look at the in-kind, and you see Wasi's share of Capital West charges. That's the best estimate that I have as to how much Wasi is responsible for for the bill that we're paying. So we pay that now. So what they're offering to do is say, we're going to recognize the fact that Waterbury is already paying something. The building lease value, and maybe Mark remembers the this, this square footage and the numbers that he and I exchanged, but um, we have a building. How many square feet is it? A couple thousand square feet. 
Uh, <clears throat> the town has provided that to WASI, and we have a lease with WASI. They paid us $250 two years ago, and that takes care of their lease for 20 years or something like that. So Mark and I worked together and just said, okay, if we were going to be leasing this property to them and actually asking a market rate for it, and I kept it on the low side of the market rate, but um, we figured that the lease value of the building on an annualized basis would be $20,400. So um, those are not expenses that they necessarily have. I think their true budget shortfall is $70,000, and they want to raise $70,000. Um, and whether they backed into the, to the uh, per capita fee or not, they understood that Waterbury was providing in-kind uh, payments to them that the other towns weren't. So to cover the $70,000 shortfall, they kind of did some backwards calculations and came up with this 183, and that works out that Duxbury pays almost 25,000, Moortown pays about 5,400, 5, and we have to pay the rest, and I think ongoing expense that the municipality has covered uh, it kind of just struck me odd as to why it's there at all because that's been an ongoing thing and it's kind of part of the system that's currently in place uh, but if you so didn't recognize if you didn't recognize that, that Chris figure I guess Chris but if time. Chris Chris uh, if you didn't recognize that Chris we would be paying more because if you took 70,000 and you divided it by the, the population of the three towns, it would be a different number and Waterbury would be paying more than we're paying. We, we are already paying the $36,000 for the dispatching is a hard number and they need to give us credit for that. If they didn't give any credit for this, they would spread the $70,000 over the population between the three towns and we'd be paying a higher amount. Right, I'm just, that's why I'm saying that 56,000 is showing the recognition of those expenses that we already pay. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm all set. Okay, thanks Chris. Um, just a uh, uh, curiosity question on the part of your current structure and what you see in the future. I'm well aware of how the volunteer and uh, at basically public safety involvement at all. It's, it's, uh, it's a tough uh, field out there trying to attract people in and, and retain them. Um, in Vermont, my understanding is that uh, the, the model that we have here in Waterbury is one of the models that's there. There's, there's another model that kind of incorporates uh, um, being a subset of fire departments and the professional firefighters associated with that. Um, is, is there another variation that's out there that we're not aware of? Just municipally owned yeah. independent services such as Northfield who has their own ambulance service which is not part of the fire department. Do they have, they face the same struggles with staffing and everything? Yeah, absolutely. Like in the winter time, I run with Northfield myself, I live there. In the winter time, it's great because you have the Norwich students there, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. Come summer, there's three of us, maybe four. Yeah, yeah. So um, am I correct in understanding that you've made arrangements with the other two communities as far as um, items on their uh, their town meeting ballot, or we just left Moortown. Okay, so you're having the same discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, based on what um, uh, Bill had provided us for previous information, it, it looked like there were a, a couple of avenues for that. I, I do think that this is an issue that the the voters need to weigh in on. Um, your service is invaluable to the community and. Uh, really, uh, folks in the community have to make the decision um, where they feel that would fall. Um, the only issue that Bill had was 
uh, about the general practice that we've had with requiring a petition in order to get onto uh, the, uh, the town meeting ballot, but my sense is I wouldn't be inclined to bother with that. I, I think this is clearly an issue of concern for all of us in the community, and simply adding it on uh, makes good sense to me. Yeah, I agree with you, Mark. Um, at, at first, I was uh, uh, had inklings of maybe just approving it ourselves, but after a little bit of thought about it, I said it might be a good topic of discussion and uh, transparency for the voters to uh, weigh in on this and, and uh, give them uh, a stake in the game as far as the decision making. Uh, I wouldn't think that, you know, just speaking for myself, I wouldn't think they would uh, turn this down in any way, shape, or form, but uh, it'd be good that they uh, at least have the discussion uh, amongst themselves along with the board at that time to uh, reinforce it, you know? Your, your budget year is uh, July 1st, did you correct? Correct. So if we pass this at town meeting in March, the payment that we made will be after July 1st for the 18-19 fiscal year. Okay. And um, you are meeting or have met with the other towns, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that making them go the route of the petition is, uh, is too much, <coughs> and I wouldn't recommend that. Um, So we'll, we'll put it on our, our warning um, and, and we'll move from there. So the, just so you know, Chris, I was half right before. If you took the $70,000 that they're uh, in the hole and you simply divided it by the number of people in the three towns, it's 6746, six, it'd be about $10.83 per capita and then you'd have to multiply our population of 5136 by 10, and it would be about $53,000 that we would be paying as opposed to the 40 now. So um, it's the fact that they're reflecting what we're already doing for them is helpful to us, and it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any next step that we need to take? Just come to town oh meeting and be prepared to speak to the article, Perfect. I think would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you Do you have much. a pre-town meeting? No. no. We have all our fun in one day. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> some, of, some of you live in Waterbury here, so you can, <laughs> you can come. I, I think people will really um, um, appreciate being educated about this topic. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, Thanks, for, for, Thanks for your work, Happy too. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. All right, moving right along, the manager's items. Uh, the preliminary conversation concerning the 2019 budget. Yeah, this won't take too long. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you looked at your computer, but I did send you an email. I think my wife was working on printing off those six sheets. I don't know if she uh, okay. they're not, was successful with it. They're not all that important. So um, we're going to start with those budget sheets first. So if you just take the top page off and turn it over for a second, we'll just look at the budget sheets. Um, as I said earlier, I, I have started working on the budget and making some decent progress. Um, and there's just some things that um, I want you to know about. Uh, as in every budget, there's expenses that are overspent and there are others that are underspent. Uh, the revenues are, um, they're kind of uh, a big part of the equation because obviously we take our expenses and subtract our non-property tax revenues from them to determine how much we need to raise in taxes. So. The budget sheets that I have, I just want you to see a little bit of the good news, I guess you could say, that we've received uh, from 
um, the revenues, and mainly from the, from the state, excuse me. So looking at that first page of the general fund, which is Fund 11, um, the property tax line at the top, that fluctuates, that goes up and down based on downloads that we get from the state constantly having to do with uh, whether somebody has a non-residential or residential property and it changes. Unfortunately, uh, the changes don't affect any budget except the town's general fund budget. So the highway budget will get all its money, the library budget will get all its money, the school budget gets all its money and usually more because most of the downloads end up costing more to the education. But we only sent a bill out in the, one bill in the summertime. Individual bills get adjusted, but any variation hits that general fund property tax line. So right now, we're, we're down. At the end of the year, we'll hit a button that will turn uh, the billed amount into an actual received amount, and then we'll have delinquencies to, to collect. Uh, it's not unusual for that line to be well below 100% at this time of year. But moving down the page, the village administrative service fee, uh, they owe one more quarter's worth to us, and when they pay that, uh, the $100,000 line item will have been met. Pilot, we, we broke the pilot up this year, if you remember. We put $200,000 in here, which is more than we had last year, and we put the balance into the paving fund, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, the reimbursement from Forest and Parks Recreation for all of the forest land that we have, Putnam State Forest, Mount Mansfield State Forest, um, we're actually going to, we have actually received already about $11,000 or so more than budgeted, so that's a plus. Uh, the VTrans liaison state grant line where there's a check mark next to that. Um, I'm not sure it will go all the way up to 49,000, but it will go up. That's the line item that we pay Barb far out of, and uh, whatever she spends will come in. So you know that that will that will go up further. So just with the the village and the uh, or year to date, that other governments is at 587,717, uh, and. At minimum, it's going to be 611840. So we're going to have a little bit more revenue in that than we anticipated. And then over on the second page, um, we haven't transferred the amount from the reappraisal fund yet. So our revenues in the general fund are going to be a little bit higher than anticipated, which is always welcome news. Um, moving forward, I just showed you fund 12. And I think on the back side of that, you'll see fund 13. Um, we're going to probably be um, right on the money on uh, 12. We will have a little bit more payment from that highway labor and materials line. Uh, the WASI fuel was up a little bit. The two main uh, revenues in that fund are um, the property taxes and the Vermont state aid where we haven't received the state grant yet. If we don't get it, we didn't do the project, so that will, that will watch. Fund 13 is the library. Uh, they're slightly higher than what they budgeted. Um, the library fund is probably going to be overexpended, though. Uh, we did not plan for or know that Mary Kasamatsu was going to be leaving. Uh, when she retired, uh, she had some leave time that we had to pay out, and then uh, we had, um, you know, we hired another uh, director, and um, we have some unanticipated expenses there. The next fund, 48, uh, we'll come back to that. That really goes with the memo that I had you turn over at the beginning, so you can put that with that <laughs> other memo and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, in the paving budget, Fund 70, and, and this, is, this is good news, um, the transfer into the paving CIP from the Highway Fund was 288, 288,000 as budgeted. 
Uh, the transfer from the reserve fund that we had, that was the old roundabout fund, was a little bit more than we anticipated. And then the pilot proceeds, we, we thought we were going to get $270,000 of pilot money. We put 200 in the general fund, which we budgeted, but the pilot payment was actually almost $282,000. So there's another uh, $12,000 that went in, and I put the excess into the uh, paving fund. If you want it to go into the general fund, I can switch it back, but I thought since we're gearing up for some major paving, having some money here would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> On the expenses for paving, the class three paving, and I believe I put this in a memo to you in, in my town manager's report that I also sent out. Um, we did all the paving we had planned to do plus uh, more. We did uh, Hollow Road this year. That was not in the budget. Um, on Whistle Mountain, when we got up there, it turned out that while we had the water and sewer departments adjust all the manholes and, and water shutoffs and valves and the like. And then uh, the highway department uh, adjusted uh, storm drain manholes and catch basins. And we rebuilt a lot of those things. So the uh, public works crews worked pretty closely together to get all that done. When we got there, it turned out we didn't need to reclaim anywhere near as much as Whistle Mountain than we uh, had anticipated. So we did more paving than we had planned. There's more blacktop down on the ground. There are more streets right now that are smooth. I won't promise they'll stay smooth for 100 years or even 10 years, but we did a lot more paving than we anticipated. And it didn't cost us anywhere near as much as we thought. So we've been budgeted 550,000. We spent 374. Um, that will all drop to the bottom line. So between the revenue that we have, and I, I didn't look at the uh, you know fund balance coming into the year. I didn't have time to do a full analysis. But we had higher revenues than anticipated, uh, significantly lower expenses than we anticipated. So that uh, what we carry forward into next year will be higher than, than we uh, expected that it would be. So um, that's good news for next year. I'm not saying that, we're, that we won't have to finance if we pave Loomis Hill, but we've got more resources in the paving fund already than we thought we would have. So um, I'll stop there if you have any questions. Anyone, including Chris. <laughs> Chris, you probably don't have any information to look at to have any questions, but was... I, I've got the information in front of me, and, the, and I don't have any questions. The only comment I have is that in a perfect world, uh, it'd be nice to uh, leave that money in the paving CIP and uh, uh, not, again, in the perfect world, not have to use it as part of the financing for any additional uh, paving that we were thinking about doing next year, but use it as uh, on top of um, so we could, if possible, do even more next year. Well, it's, we it's going to be, it's going to be hard to, it's, it's going to be hard to do more than we've already thinking that we're going to do next year. I mean, that's a pretty um, aggressive project to get all of Loomis Hill done the way that we're anticipating doing it. Uh, we can have this discussion later, Chris, um, and the money is going to be staying in the paving fund. And whether we want to use the money to reduce the financing that might be necessary or if we want to just leave it there and do more later, either way, it's, a, it's a, an asset in the paving fund and we'll have an opportunity to discuss how we'll use it. I'm, I'm pleased that we were able to do more than we thought this year for less money, and that gives us options going forward that we didn't think we were going to have. And we can have the discussion how we're going to use it later, but it's an asset that we have that's a little bit unanticipated, and that's good news from my point of view, anyway. Absolutely good news. Okay. Yeah, I would just echo that, because I know 
the year before we weren't able to achieve even what we had planned to do right. and we bolstered it this year in the hopes that we would be able to get more done and we did so yeah. all around that's a that's a good success and we did and we didn't spend as much as we thought so anyway the other information and i know uh if i could see chris's face here uh, <laughs> i'd be interested to hear what he's thinking uh, we did get some news the other day. The Main Street project was put out to bid by VTrans. As you know, it's a VTrans project. Uh, the bidding was on uh, Friday. And um, the estimate was, uh, you know, 25 to $30 million. Uh, there were four bidders uh, for the project. J.A. McDonald was the low bidder at $21 million and change. Um, so that's good news on two fronts, I think. One, uh, it was only slightly more than the $20 million that was estimated several years ago, and it was not as high as they were fearing. Uh, so the $21 million is a good number. Uh, J.A. McDonald is the company that did the roundabout work. They were an excellent contractor to work with. Um, this project will be run by VTrans, and their relationship will be directly with uh, VTrans and the VTrans inspector. Our people will be obviously involved in the background and will be very much in tune with this job. But at 2% at of 21 million, the local share is about $420,000 which is a little bit lower than we were estimating. I'm still working now to divide out from the 420 that the local is responsible for how much of that is water and sewer. Um, I think the last that I was talking with Barb about, she thought she had identified about a million and a half dollars of water and sewer. Um, that's something that we may discuss a little bit. Um, if that's the case, if it's one and a half million for water and sewer, um, they would the EFUD would be responsible for seventy five thousand and would be responsible for three forty five. If it's a little higher than one point five million, their share would go up and our share would go down. Um, the three hundred and forty five thousand, if we just accept that as our estimated cost right now will be over three construction seasons, two and a half construction seasons. Um, so we're gonna have to factor that into our game plan as to how we uh, fund this. Um, I don't know yet, I haven't been able to get into the weeds at this point, and I'm not even sure if if anybody could. You know, I don't know how much of the costs are front loaded in the first year versus the second year or the third year, but um, all in all, it's it, it's about as good news as we could get in terms of the price, and I think we've got a really good contractor, which I, I hope will bode well for a fairly smooth project. They did an excellent job on the roundabout. Any uh, okay. observations, Chris? <laughs> No, that's great news, Bill. Um, the the, the uh, issue of you know what's going to be our cost over the next three years. I mean, if we just kind of cut it down the center and said it was a hundred and a little over a hundred thousand dollars a year, I'm just again trying to keep in my head constantly uh, what we're going to be faced with. So the discussion we had a while back about Paven Loomis Hill, uh, the 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 new um, trucks, uh, fire trucks and, and highway trucks uh, that we're going to need and uh, with the police department, um, additional costs there and uh, now tonight's discussion with the ambulance service. So if, if the additional police department is 185 over what we paid this year plus another 40 from the ambulance, that's two and a quarter. Um, and you know, if it were a hundred, let's for even numbers, hundred thousand, would it be safe to say we're going to be 
Well, I'm not, I'm not, not ready to make a prediction yet. There's a lot right, of things, no. lot of yeah. things that's got to be factored into the equation. I've got all the things that you're talking about already kind of in the hopper, and I'm working towards it. Um, if we're lucky, maybe I'll have some uh, preliminary numbers either the first or more likely the second meeting in December. But uh, I'm, I'm working to get as much of this information as possible. And, uh, you know, there are some, some revenues that will be going up. Um, the pilot payments, um, you know, the formula for pilot payments have as one of its factors tax rates. So if our tax rates go up, this all things being equal, the state uses a higher tax rate in their calculation, and they would pay us more. Um, the the uh, I didn't bring next year's budget, but that Forest and Parks uh, money at 63,618 is going to be higher next year than it was this year, even though it was already $12,000 higher than we budgeted. So, you know, there's some things that are that will be working in our favor. They're certainly not going to make up $150,000 worth, but um, I'll have more information in December. But all the things that you've identified are already things that I'm uh, working on pretty hard to try to solidify the numbers on. Yep. Well, I appreciate it too, Bill. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so if you go back to the, the memo that I wrote to you, and uh, this, is, this is a discussion that I've been starting to have with the library commissioners uh, a couple of months ago, and I thought it would be something that we should at least talk about from the town's perspective. Uh, this memo basically lays out from 2006 to the present what we've transferred to the general operating funds from the town's tax stabilization fund and the library's trust fund. Um, and as you can see, especially if you look at the town, um, in 2006, we, were, we had pro prospective budgeting at the time. So we would kind of look at what was happening in the markets, look at past performance, and pick a number that we thought we were going to um, hit as far as uh, a number that we were going to be able to transfer. We budgeted 25000 in 2006. The market had a really good year, and we actually transferred 64000 Then the next year, we budgeted fifty-three, and the market didn't. It still did pretty well, but it didn't do as well as we thought, and we transferred 31000 Then in 2008, we had the financial collapse. And basically, from 2008 through 2011, we had planned to do nothing. And then we got hit by the flood, which caused even more consternation. So for uh, five years, we didn't transfer anything. And then in uh, 13 and 14, we kind of made up for lost time. We transferred some big numbers that were outside of the formula that we had typically used. And that was all given discussion that the select board had with me at the time, and we, we picked those numbers and, and did it in order to help uh, buffer the tax rate a little bit. Starting in 2014, we actually changed the way that we calculated the formula. We actually looked at the performance that we had in the current year. So we looked at the performance in 2013 and then applied the formula and said, OK, in 2014, we can transfer $55,000. So we, we budgeted it, and we transferred the exact amount. And since 2014, you'll see that both in the library and in the town tax stabilization fund, which is on the left-hand side, um, the, the actual transfer was actually the exact amount of money that we budgeted. The library, uh, there was some rounding errors, but you know, pretty much dollar for dollar that we budgeted was transferred. Um, what I started talking about with the library commissioners, because they had a pretty hefty transfer last year, um, $35,700. They had a particularly good uh, increase in their um, 
portfolio. The town had a good increase, but not quite as good because the town's portfolio is significantly higher than the library's, and we were able to transfer about the same amount of money. So um, in both cases, uh, a little more than $35,000 was transferred, and it was based on the formula. Um, when I look at this, I'm just a little concerned that even though we're looking prospectively now or retrospectively now and we can hit our budget number exactly, there's still volatility from year to year. You know, one year we transfer 44850 in 2015 and then in, in that year the, the market doesn't do well and we don't transfer anything. Uh, the next year we transfer 282, then this year we transfer 37515. And it's looking like for 2019, if we apply the same formula, we'll probably not be able to transfer anything because the market is down right now. So we don't have to make a decision tonight. I'm sending this off to the library commissioners as well. They, they make the determination from their trust fund. But I'm wondering, rather than apply this formula, if we should maybe just look at averages and say, for the next five years, we're going to transfer, I picked the number for the town, $25,800, $25, and for the library, $15,000. Just put that in the budget. Both funds are, frankly, robust enough that you could transfer twenty-five-eight even if the market had an average down year. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the down year was like 2008, and it was 50%, <laughs> you could adjust that in your next year's budget and say, you know, we really ought not to take anything out of this because it took too big of a hit. So we can talk about this more as we get into the budget season, but what I'm trying to do is be able to consistently plan on a certain amount of money and you avoid that swing because when we went from 44,850 in 2015 and dropped to nothing the next year, everything being equal, we had you know a four sevenths yeah. cent tax rate increase that year because we just didn't get anything. So um, that's just something for your consideration as we start heading into budget season. The the fund 48 that I told you goes along with this simply shows you that to date. We've earned $10,000 of interest on the tax stabilization fund, but we've had $11,190 of unrealized losses. And that was actually through October 31st, and November has been worse. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. The market was down at 400 and something points earlier today. So I think the unrealized gains are going to be down. And in a normal year, if it turns out that you know, we don't transfer anything to the tax from the tax stabilization fund unless we have a <coughs> return that's greater than 3%. The first 3% stays with the tax stabilization fund. The next 5% gets transferred to the general fund. And then above 8%, we, we split on a 60-40 basis, leaving 60 in. So in a year that we lose money, we clearly don't make it a transfer, or, or we haven't. So anyway, this is just for your consideration. If you have questions now, I'll answer them, but it's just to think about. A lot of times, investing philosophy uh, tends to lean towards a long view anyway, so using a, a larger block to make your adjustment. The only thing for me would be having that, that circuit, circuit breaker piece in there that if, if things uh, consistently were down, that we would, uh, we would shy away from that. And I think the, the sense that I have with, uh, with this board is they're conservative enough that that would be the case. Yeah, and I mean, the, the fund itself started at $644,000. Um, if it ever went below that, we we're prohibited by the action that the town created to set up the fund yep. from going below that. But I didn't bring the town report with me, but um, and I didn't print the balance sheet. But we were in the, you know, I think the year started 
and the fund was about $935,000. So we've transferred from the fund about $520,000 in the 27 years that we've had it. Mm -hmm. And the fund is still, it's about 300,000 higher than it then was when we started, and we've transferred $521,000 <coughs> into the general fund for the benefit of the taxpayers. So it could certainly withstand in a normal down year a yeah. uh, $25,000 um, transfer. We would miss the really you know, big transfers in the up years, but in the year that happens, it's great, but you kind of set yourself up for, oh, yeah. even if you have an right. average year the next year, you right. set yourself up for loss, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right, the, uh, the last item we had was uh, uh, Chris's um, piece with the police reporting, so uh, Chris, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I was noticing on the information that you sent, the percentage of uh, you know, the, the uh, calls that uh, our contracted police force had uh, entertained and uh, the percentage of, of calls that, uh, I'm trying to pull it up here real quick, percentage of calls that uh, Middlesex kind of handled. Yeah. Um, got 43% of the Middlesex troopers and 57% uh, of the resident troopers. I was curious to know, um, you know, is it, is, is it our assumption that at some point the resident trooper graph or portion chunk of the pie might be greater? Um, or is this the result of, uh, simply a result of uh, uh, the fact that our resident troopers aren't on in those specific times when the Middlesex troopers are doing the bulk of their, uh, their calls, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of a twofold thing. In this month, um, one of the troops was off uh, for vacation time, so he, he missed seven work days, so uh, that that's basically a week's worth of one shift that uh, that wasn't covered. Um, I the the focus on tracking that really is is to show um, whether or not we we uh, really need that presence in the community and. When you're seeing the amount of workload that the troopers that are assigned here are, it's it's pretty clear that it's worth having having them around. The uh, the piece about it is the uh, the difference in the response time and the fact that they cover calls that uh, probably wouldn't wouldn't get any sort of response otherwise. But the other side of the coin is that we're, we're, we're still looking at um, uh, at, at least 20 to perhaps 40 percent of the workload in the town that occurs outside of those hours that we've got shift coverage um, and folks just need to know that uh, there's there's activity that that is taking place um, I think uh, Bill and I had talked about the prospect of trying to get um, the lieutenant here for our meeting on December 17th um, and we can get the perspective from him on what the feedback has been on both sides uh, both uh, the resident troopers and the station troopers I know when I talked with them uh, during the last month uh, it's it's still a very positive thing the um, having the resident troopers here takes uh, immense burden off the uh, station troopers, and uh, even even with that, the station troopers, when they do come here, it's kind of like a uh, a new experience, and they're uh, uh, they're I think they're a little more engaged than uh, just the uh, perspective of oh, got to go to another Waterbury call. Well, I, my my concern was that this graph uh, would deter Middlesex from wanting to continue with this program because uh, I didn't know if their expectations was that the resident troopers would be taking more of the pie, but 
the way you talk, it, uh, it sounds like uh, it's working in their favor already anyway. Yeah, that's it's been the, the feedback that we've been getting. Uh, tomorrow night I've got uh, the community advisory board meeting, so I'll, I'll have better information on that. But I think if uh, Lieutenant White can join us at the December meeting, we'll all have a chance to have first-hand discussion. Yeah. yeah. Just, just, as, just as Mark said, Chris, just the, uh, the day and a half that we don't have coverage under this contract, we don't have any coverage from the resident troopers on Sunday, and then on Monday, well, actually, it's more because we have only a half a day on, on Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. So it's probably about, you know, 23% of the work week we don't have a resident trooper on anyway, just in those shifts. And then when you factor in the hours from 2 in the morning until they come on at 7 or 8, um, you know, those, those 5 or 6 hours uh, when everybody's home in bed, if there's a call then, it's going to be Middlesex that takes it. So you're probably pushing, you know, 25% of our time we don't have a resident trooper on anyway. And then, as Mark said, when somebody's on leave time, they're on vacation, uh, the contract, if, if one of the troopers just goes on vacation for a week, the contract does not contemplate that they fill that in with a, another resident trooper. If somebody yeah, was- I'm aware of that. If somebody I was- I think it, if somebody went on vacation, they'd just put somebody in to fill them while they were gone. But no, they don't. Vacation. If somebody was um, so if they, also suggest maybe that based on this graph, if, if a lot of the activity is happening uh, on that half day Saturday and the Sunday, is that is that safe to assume? No, no, because it uh, it it has variability, um, and what we've got for numbers, um, I I'm not able to parse that deeply into it. Um, but I have seen on occasions where uh, the um, uh, resident troopers are on duty here, uh, there may be one or two other troopers from Middlesex that are making traffic stops in the area. So I've, I've seen activity that, that shows a double up like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, so we are at... Time for adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion to adjourn. All right. And Matt's got the second. I'll second that. All right. Oh, um, Chris, good luck with the rest of your trip. Yeah, you all have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, you, you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll see you when I get back. Sounds good. Bye.